The red planet Mars is back in the news. And as NASA continues its Perseverance mission, I've been thinking a lot about some of my favorite images over the years from Mars. What I think, though, is not nearly as important as this person. Space historian Andy Chaikin, who is the author of A Man on the Moon, as well as A Passion for Mars, joins us from his home in a wintry Vermont to share with us his 10 favorite and reasonably significant images from Mars over the years. Andy, thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to be with you, Miles. Would it be accurate to say you picked your 10 favorites or the 10 most significant or 10 significant favorites? What I've done is I, I, I've picked 10 images that, you know, to me tell a story of the, the unveiling of Mars step by step. The twists and turns of this ongoing experience of exploration and discovery. First on your list is what? So Mariner 4 was the very first spacecraft to take close-up pictures of another planet in July 1965. And what we see here are two of those images, which are very crude by today's standards, but they were good enough to show Mars in a way that no telescope could ever have revealed. And it was actually a shock to the scientists because what you see in this picture are craters uh, more resembling the moon than the Earth. I mean, to see so many craters and such large craters, the one on the right-hand image, the biggest crater is 70 miles across, means that we're looking at a surface that is ancient, billions of years old. This was overnight a change from the red planet to, as the New York Times called it, the dead planet. All right, but wait, there's more. Stay with us because the plot changes as we go along here. Let's go to image number two now. So in 1971, Mariner 9 became the first spacecraft to go into orbit around Mars. And with that vantage point, it could do a much more comprehensive exploration. And what you see here is a mosaic of images of the solar system's largest volcano. It was named Olympus Mons, in other words, Mount Olympus. It is three times higher than Mount Everest, 90,000 feet high. Now we have a planet with a story to tell. Mars continues to unveil itself. Let's go to number three. In 1976, a pair of orbiters for the Viking mission went into orbit around Mars, equipped with better cameras, so there's a bit more detail in these images. This is a mosaic of pictures that shows, amidst all the craters, a network of channels that are branching just like drainage channels on Earth. So this is very compelling evidence that even though Mars today is bone dry, that in the distant past, liquid water must have flowed across the surface. And of course, that raised the tantalizing question of whether there might have been life at the time the water was flowing or might even still exist somehow on Mars, even if it was only microbial life. In the hubris of the era, NASA set the bar pretty high for Viking. Did it still succeed? Oh my God, Viking was an incredible success. I mean, the landing, just from an engineering point of view, the landing was like the robotic equivalent of Apollo. And no Neil Armstrong on board to dodge boulders and craters. In fact, if you look at this panorama from Viking, uh, you can see a boulder in the near distance that's about the size of a desk, and it's only about 30 feet away from the lander. And if the lander had come down on that boulder, it would have been curtains. Um, so that was just blind luck. And what you see in this image is that Mars is covered with a layer of iron oxide, in other words, rust, that gives Mars its reddish color. The red planet really is red. But what Viking's instruments revealed was that in that dust, there appears to be highly reactive compounds, which are peroxides and superoxides that apparently are hostile to organic matter or carbon bearing molecules. And so Viking's instruments found no trace of organics whatsoever, never mind life. In every other way but the life detection front, it was a spectacular success. That thought takes us to our next image, number five, because after Viking, we had a 20-year gap. Tell us about that and tell us the significance of the images we're about to see. Well, you know, there was so much expectation on Viking 
uh, that when it didn't find evidence of life, or at least conclusive evidence of life, it put kind of a big chill on Mars exploration for quite a while. So, you know, yeah, we had to wait more than 20 years until the next Mars landing. It happened on July 4th, 1997. This was a mission called Pathfinder, whose main job was to test a new kind of landing system that used high-tech airbags. Uh, of course, the star of the mission was a little microwave oven-sized rover called Sojourner, uh, which you can see here inspecting a boulder with its uh, sensors. And it really kind of um, became sort of the mascot of the Pathfinder mission. Pathfinder marks the beginning of a pretty busy era of steady exploration of Mars with you know fairly predictable time frames between missions. No more 20-year gaps. Let's talk about uh, image number six. There's an interesting backstory here, which is that most scientists studying Mars had actually opposed sending another camera into orbit around Mars because they thought, we don't need any more pictures. We've got thousands of pictures. We've discovered everything we're going to discover from orbit. Well, they had to think again when they saw images like this. This is a mosaic of images from Mars Global Surveyor. And what you see, these fan-shaped features, these sort of finger-like projections, are a fossil river delta that have been preserved in sedimentary rock. It is the smoking gun for the fact that water was flowing across Mars, not sporadically, not just you know, for a brief period, but for a long time, persistent flow of water, not just a sudden outburst, as had been theorized from earlier missions. Um, and of course, water flowing for long durations, again, raises the question of, were these habitable environments? Might there have been life living in such a river delta in the distant past? Let's go back down into the next rover era. Uh, Image number seven from Opportunity. In 2004, two landers uh, carrying rovers uh, got to Mars with the same airbag landing system that Pathfinder had used. One was called Spirit, one was called Opportunity. Opportunity had the good fortune to roll on its airbags into a 60-foot diameter crater where there were exposed layers of sedimentary rock and it nosed up to these layers with its microscopic imager. So in this picture, we're seeing an area that's just an inch across. And what we're seeing here are layers uh, that are formed from mineral salts. These salts were produced as seawater evaporated. And the little round pellet that you see is actually a little sphere. It's nicknamed a blueberry and there are thousands upon thousands of them all over the landing site. And it turned out to be made of a, an iron oxide mineral called gray hematite that had to have formed in standing water. Here was ground truth for the existence of an ancient, long dried up Martian sea. All right, let's go to image number eight. So Opportunity's twin, the rover Spirit, it spent about a year climbing up the side of a hill that's about as tall as the Statue of Liberty. So we're not talking about, you know, alpine ascents here. But for a rover, it was a big deal. And during that climb, Spirit looked down on the surrounding plains and saw dust devils kind of wheeling their way across the surface. So even in this very, very thin atmosphere, you can have these whirlwinds. And the interesting story for Spirit was that as it spent more and more time on Mars, its solar panels had gotten very, very dusty and had dropped significantly in their power output. But one day, the mission controllers saw that the power had come back up to normal, and they realized that one of these dust devils had gone right over the rover and cleaned the solar panels. All right, as long as we're, we're talking about weather, uh, which takes us to this next image, number nine, so this is another image that was taken during Spirit's, you know, year-long mountain climb, and it's a sunset on Mars. Now, the sky right around the sun, above the sun, is bluish in color, not reddish like we see here on Earth. And this is due to the fact that you have these tiny little particles of dust floating in this very thin atmosphere. 
And when they are between the sun and the observer, they scatter the blue light most efficiently. And so the result is that on Mars, uh, the sky during the daytime has kind of a reddish tinge because the dust particles are reflecting the sunlight and, and showing their reddish color. But at sunrise and sunset, because of the peculiar forward scattering, the scientists call it, uh, the sky looks bluish. So it's actually the opposite of what we see here on Earth. And it's just, you know, one of these little things that tells you we're not on Earth anymore, to coin a phrase. <laughs> a long way from Kansas. All right, and um, which takes us to number 10. We've limited it to 10, so tell us what is number 10 on our list. Curiosity, an SUV-sized rover, landed on Mars in 2012. Curiosity has been sending back thousands of images and all kinds of scientific data from its explorations of a crater called Gale Crater. It's about 96 miles wide that was once filled with water. And this is a panorama of Gale Crater. Curiosity has not only documented uh, the effects of this ancient sea inside Gale Crater, but it has found some of the organic molecules, these carbon-bearing molecules that eluded the Viking landers. And so I think of this panorama as kind of a taste of what's in store for us, uh, not only scientifically, but visually, um, after Perseverance lands. Well done, Andy Chaikin. A great pleasure talking with you always. Same here, Miles. Thanks a lot. Follow My Radar on social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.